All right, Pega will left off with this particular comic corner, which is episode 2198, double shot number 2092. Last, first part we discussed Black Lightning's Brick City Blues. This was discussing the penultimate New Year's Classic trade. Because there's one more left, and then we have two epic collections to discuss in a future video. And that's it for Volume 1. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it for Volume 1. Um, actually, on, on the poll app, so... I'll view those at some point, just not at the moment. Nope. Alright, for New Year's Classic Volume 6, this collects issues 41 and 47, along with the second annual, and on Kenny X-Men, and number 10. Why is it included here? Because the team-up annual. Yep, it's team of one. Yeah, for some reason, two annuals in a row, we have to have team annuals with the X-Men. So first up, we have Mirage versus basically Death. It's her with the Pegasus. It's basically a set right after the time in Asgard, where she got some powers of Valkyrie. And basically, spore hole Native American stuff. We have her take a shower in here. Yes, seriously. It's like a whole issue is focused on Danny Moonstar. Yep. And then 42 is focused on, looks like, Cannonball. Yes. Yeah, I think this issue 42 is also the first appearance of Mrs. Gertrude. Cannonball's mom. Who currently is a grandmother. Actually, no, her first appearance actually was in Rom and number three. And she had been, now you might be thinking, she actually previously appeared in the annual. Yeah, this is the first appearance since then. After that, she has appeared against issue 92 of this book during Rob Liefeld's time in the book. Yeah, only two times that Cannibal's mom appears in this book. And thinking, really? Oh, yeah, really. Now, one of her sons, Icarus, did also appear in the annual, too. And did her daughter appear there, too? Yes, for some reason, Cannibal had a... Like, exception of... This is kind of weird, though. They had all the Gertrude family basically appear in this ROM annual. Which, by the way, we will never see in a trade because of legal stuff that relates to license. So, it's just a one-off issue. It is interesting the fact that we have 41 focused on... Well... Yeah, we have 41 focused on Danny Moonstar, and then this one focuses on Cannonball. Yeah, that's a strange thing, though, like, it's like a spotlight issues. Yep, and then basically with 43, after we do the whole thing of, well, being a mutant, whatever. And then we finally go back to the action where we have everybody rejoining the team. Basically, let me have a family. Yeah, there's also a name Stevie Hunter. You might be curious, though. Is she still around in the X-Men comics? Yes, she is. Uh, not around very much at all. Not really, no. Uh, she was a primary character in this series. Uh, this issue here was actually her third to last appearance in this title. Yes. She appeared two more times after this, and she never appeared this title ever again. Uh, her most recent appearance was actually the third to last issue. I actually didn't know, I didn't realize this apparently at all. Apparently she appeared in the fourth to last issue, the most recent volume for the series. Yeah, I didn't realize this, I'm sorry, basically I did my review for New Mutants Volume 4, which collected the final issues of the series. I did not realize, though, the fact the book ended. I had no idea. I thought it was looking anyway. Nope, it's over. For some reason, was relaunched as New Mutants Lethal Legion. I'm not really sure exactly why Marvel did this for, but they did. And you might be curious, though. Is the same person who wrote that previous book is the same person? Yes, Charlie Jan Anders, uh, who is a woman. She, of course, writes, writes that book. Yep. 
It's like, oh yeah, come on, just to relaunch a book of the miniseries for no reason. I'm not really sure why, if I get a chance to talk about this something. So, you know, like, fall back in action, and then we have 44 return of, we have the return of Legion himself. Yes. Yeah, and then of course we have Mormon Taggart, who's been a recurring character in this book. And, well, Legion kind of, they kind of fight him this issue. Yeah. New Year's anyways do that. And then basically, then we have the second annual for the series. Yeah, second annual. Uh, if you're curious though, there were about seven years published for the series. And this annual would actually go into, it's basically, the best way to describe this annual is that it's the first American appearance of, of all people, Psylocke, Betsy Braddock. Yep. Yeah, this was her first uh, American appearance. This very common book. You're thinking, really? Oh, yeah, really. This is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost like basically, hey, let's have basically Salak appear in this issue after she previously appeared. Now, Yeah, so you could say that this book basically would just bring her over. Yep. And if you're curious, so Psylocke, Betsy Braddock, this may have been her first American appearance, but her first actual appearance was in Captain Britain number 8 in 1976. Yep, and this issue here is when she first becomes Psylocke. Yeah, in, 19, in 1986, basically almost 10 years after her debut over in UK, she's brought over here, and Psylocke has been a primary focus of the X-Books for, for decades at this point. Uh, as of currently, there are two Psylocke's around right now. You have Psylocke, who is currently Captain Britain, and we have Kanan, who takes up the name Psylocke. That one I was more familiar with as Psylocke than the original one, because basically of retired. So, and then this, of course, leads into the second, the, the tenth, and the Kenny X-Men. Yeah, for some reason, the story is kind of continued there, and then pretty much basically like, oh, by the way, love the, uh, I love the nod to Giants High Tech number one with this with this anal cover, which is so awesome. Yep. It just features the X Babies and Mojo. My only guess is the reason why that Marvel included this is the in this trade, because mutants are basically primary players in this annual. Yeah, and plus also the random book also for this thing. It's not necessarily a crossover per se, it just basically just had beer here. Also got Love 45's cover. Uh, very common cover to use in the 80s. I've seen a lot of uh, covers that look like this. They have all, all these various covers, and you just focus on one character. Now, this issue, uh, 45. Now, here's the thing with 45. Is this a spotlight issue like it was with um, issues uh, 40, 41, 42? Like, it looks like it's focused on magic. No, it's basically a full New Orleans issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have the this one shot character who gets killed off in this very issue. And we get sort of basic stuff related to the Sentinels issue. Yep, it's regular uh, Newton stuff in here. Yeah, and then we have them basically trying to take on the X Men in this issue. And finally, to cap it off, basically look like Warlock going crazy. And the cover also looks like it's a nod to, at well, least a partial nod to Fantastic Four number one. Yeah, it kind of looks like a nod to that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So basically, we deal with like, oh, this actually is the Magnus. Yes, the Magnus. You're thinking, who the heck is the Magnus? 
Uh, the Magnus, from what I've heard about this guy, he is an offspring of Warlock. Yeah. Well, actually, he is Warlock's father. And also, this guy was also basically indirectly responsible for the events of Nerosha. Yes. And I say indirectly because uh, Warlock's offspring basically did that. Mm -hmm. Now you might be thinking, is this issue here the first parents, Magnus? No, his first parents actually was issue 18. Magnus himself is no longer alive. But this actually was first appearance issue 21. He, uh, he first appeared part of the Demon Bear Saga. And then after issue 50, he an issue of Can he actually appear again to Warlock Volume f 5. Which focused on the techno version of him. The version of Warlock. Now I'm Warlock. Completely different character. So I think I'm War uh, Magnus issue. And that's it. It's an overall really good annual. Pure classic stuff when it comes to X-Men. Now, you might be interesting to ask this was issue 47 the final time that chris claremont wrote the book if you're really curious what was the last issue he wrote for the book of this very series i'm about to answer that question for you because he wrote this book mostly since issue one I think 54 may be his last issue. Um. Yeah, I think 54 was his last issue he wrote for the series. Mm-hmm. So I think with uh, the very next trade, basically we switch writers. Yep, to the third writer. Third, I think it's the second writer who wrote this book. Uh, and the Sinti writes some issues per se. Yeah, she herself, if you're curious though, she would write occasionally some issues for this book, not much. I thought she did at one point, she did. Um, I could have sworn she did. I guess not. So apparently, New Mutants only had about two writers because apparently the, uh, well, the person who placed her was a uh, person who placed, um, Chris Clement was Louise Simonson, and Louise Simonson herself would pretty much be the writer of this book, issue fifty five to about, uh. Well, her last issue was issue number 97. That was her last issue you wrote for the book? Mm-hmm. Yes. Because, of course, Rob Liefeld would do some writing duties with issue number 98. I'll be discussing, basically, the remainder of this run and a later review. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about that. But in the case of News Classic Volume 6, it's pretty good. I give it roughly a... I'm going to give it roughly a 9.5 out of 10. Yep. But yeah, that's it for the review. Next up, more Turbo Ranger. Okay, thank you. Bye.